Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, IDRI ECR presentation. Uh, we have the presentation by Dr. Uh, Dr. Feynman Su. Uh, the topic of the presentation is baseline DNA methylation profile predict severe SARS COVID 2 development trajectory post hospitalization. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Su. Uh, Dr. Feynman Su is a postdoctoral fellow at the Pellegrini Lab in the Department of Molecular Cell and Development Biology, MCDB, at UCLA. With a PhD from University of Tokyo, she specializes in, she specializes in bioinformatics. She holds an MS degree in molecular and cellular biology and a BS degree in life science from National Taiwan University. So without much to you, let's welcome Dr. Zhu. And over to you. Thank you, TB, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining the uh, this presentation, my presentation today. So um, I'm happy to share like our recent studies about um, DNA methylations in severe COVID-19 cases. Um, so um, let's just start it. So um, as you may know, like um, so, uh, COVID-19 is a disease caused by a specific virus called severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2. So it is an RNA protein, um, RNA virus, like you can see there, um, is structures on the left hand side. So it's basically contains single stranded RNAs, but like um, encapsulated by envelope, and there will be spike proteins on top of it, which um, folk, um, is responsible for how the virus in, um, fused into the host cells. So usually on the host cells, there will be specific receptors ACE2 to docking and then make the virus into the host cells. So these specific pathogens caused COVID-19 diseases. And um, since um, 2020, there will uh, be global pandemic and causes like more than 780 million cases and more than 7 million deaths around the world. So on the right hand half, Right inside is a brief pathogenesis for how this virus um, um, how this virus is like uh, transduced into the cells. So there will be spike proteins, which is combined by S1 and S2. So they will docking through the ACE2 angiotensin um, enzyme 2 on host cells. And then another protease um, is called TNPRSS2. They will cleave this. Um, uh, spike proteins and make it to be activate. And then is the time like when the virus fused onto the host cell membranes and transduced those um, RNAs into the host cells. And then of course, when the virus genetic materials go into the host cells, they will start several immune responses. So the most majestic one would be the jack state pathways on the left, right hand side showing up here. And also those interferon weak pathways on the uh, left hand side. So this is what we know for the pathogenesis. And we want to know more through the epigenetic regulation lenses. So um, today, the focus will be the DNA methylations. So here specifically means like, um, adding one methyl group to the um, cytosine, which is one of the nuclear bases to compost DNAs. So you can see through a specific group of proteins called DNA methyltransferase. Um, they were adding one methyl group to the cytosine resulted in the five methyl cytosines. And this process could be reversed by another group of proteins called TET. So in mammalian cells like human and mouse, um, this specific phenomenon, DNA methylation, occurs majority on uh, those CG dinucleotide across the genomes. Of course, there will be several CH, um, H means A, C, or T but they will be really minor in the mammalian cells. So today we're only focused on the CG methylations. So DNA methylation together with other um, mechanisms or sort of nucleosome positioning 
histone modifications. These are epigenetic modifications. So they will modulate gene expression, uh, several biological processes without changing the DNA sequences. So usually DNA methylations, they will be seen as a cumulative exposure records for the specific individuals. For example, um, like smoking will change the uh, DNA methylomes pretty dramatically. Okay, so there's also tissue specific gene transcription regulated by methylations. You might heard of imprinting. So it's happening in ver very early stage of embryo development. And also there will be like tumor suppressor gene silenced by um, DNA methylation. So it's also not like DNA methylation could silence the virus gene expressions, for example, in hepatitis C, this kind of virus. And usually in the um, virus studies, uh, there will be epigenetic memory or trained immunities in the uh, infectious disease have been known or to keep pursuing in this um, area. But since COVID-19 is rather new and SARS-CoV-2 is also new, so we know very little about methylations and the SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. So this is the end of this study. Is what uh, we want to know more about how, what is the role for DNA methylation to play in the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the first question here is, do we know if DNA methylation will change along with the SARS-CoV-2 infection? So um, last year, there, will, there is a, a large cohort studies um, that are trying to do this. So it's called CHARM. So specifically the recruit um, individuals in US Marine. So this is a longitudinal Muslim dynamics um, they recruited those asymptomatic or mildly asymptomatic COVID cases in these young men. So um, they are rather like looking to these people from them still healthy, got infected and get into quarantine and then uh, recover. So they have this time lapse data from um, US Marine. So they profile their math along with the array uh, technologies by Illumina and they, they propose this DNA methylation clock for those pre, during, and post-infection prediction from this large cohort. So from their studies, they can pretty much see these linear um, correlations from the prediction and also the true um, days post-infections um, correlation. And they also find that the methylation clock, so starting from control, which is the healthy state, when they first detected for positive and then the de uh, development for this um, mild cases. And they will sort of go back to the very beginning of this infection state. So that is their um, main result thing. This is like methylation clock in this charm cohort. So in our studies, we're looking in a little bit different aspect. So this project would be called uh, Immunophenotyping Assessment in COVID-19 Cohort. So this, um, in this study, we enrolled symptomatic, those are severe cases, confirmed hospitalized COVID-19 patients across the US from 20 uh, medical centers. And then um, it's also a longitudinal clinical phenotyping starting from the day one of they enter the hospital and getting stayed. So from this large cohort, um, the first impact studies, they identified those five different trajectories for this um, during their 20, 28 days of follow-up. You, you could see that there's uh, starting from one to five, uh, they're in on those res the severity across different time point. So for example, for uh, TG1s means they will be uh, hospitalized for a few days and they will be um, their condition goes uh, better and they will be discharged within like two weeks. And then this, um, as, uh, when it goes to TG5, which means these are fatal cases, um, even though they got hospitalized and those medical treatment, they still um, um, died um, after this um, treatment. So we are profiling this uh, cases methylation um, to study the changing. So to be uh, specific, looking to the study designs, so we've um, recruited the patients since day one, and this will be the follow-up for one year. 
So as you, uh, as I shown in the previous slides, so their trajectory is based on a large pool of the studies. So they will classify the patients into um, their longitudinal development of the uh, uh, cases. So here we subset the whole impact cohort for, to those only UCLA only cases, which means there's like less of the cases, but they still like uh, profiled by the whole impact studies. And we collect their peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So it will be the easiest uh, biopsies to get. So they will be containing those white blood cells um, to profile their immune response and related with DNA methylation. And we profile with this targeted by sulfide sequencing technology. technologies. We're going to talk about this later. So how we analyze methylations, um, this is the traditional way by sulfide sequencing. So here is a DNA sequences. As you may know, they were composed by A, C, G, and T, these four nucleobases. On the cytosines, there will be some to be methylated. So I put this in methyl here, and some to be unmethylated. So this is the uh, DNA sequence. So when we do bisulfide conversions, which means we treated the DNA with sodium bisulfide, this chemical, in high temperature for a long period of time. So after this, we amplify the sequence, we'll get sequence like this one. So those methylated seeds will remain to be cytosine, but the unmethylated ones will be converted into thymine. Okay, so this is the sequence we obtain. So when we compare to the, for example, human reference genomes, we see this CC alignment, but this is CT conversions. This is how we know whether this position is methylated or non-methylated. So this is how we profile for the DNA methylations. And here we are applying the targeted by sulfide sequencing, which as the name saying, is like enriched for a specific of the regions we're looking to. So here on the left-hand side would be the process for library prep, starting from the DNA sharings and then putting on those um, adapters for Illumina platforms. And we pull these libraries together and we added one more step during the library prep station a step. So we can hybridize with specific nucleotide code probes. So these probes are designed based on the regions we want to study. So when we when they hybridize it and then it's converted with the sodium bisulfide and then profile for the sequencing. So it's all about how we design a probe. So we designed a probe based on several literatures. So they're related to health outcomes or specific immune cell types. And they were showing definitely higher intra or intertissue variances. And also they are kept catching up those epigenetic clock uh, related to age. So you can see here on this plot, this is the enrichment of the genes. Well, we are profiling with this TBS-C probes. So they're mainly responsive to immune defenses, to virus, um, sort of the functions across the human genomes. So with this panel, we can only just sequence very small fraction of the human genome, like four megabyte, um, but with really deep coverage. So it's really cost effective in the cohort studies aspect. So from this study, so we are totally collecting samples from 75 patients that is shown in the uh, raw years. Okay, so with different time points, um, they are keep collecting the PBMC samples and we profile in total 182 targeted by sulfide sequencing samples. So they were confirmed by genotyping and also um, um, in total, we got like 42K CPG size sequence across the 182 samples. Here is their um, correct characteristics. So you can see they're uh, very wide. Um, they are rather like uh, around the age of 61s. And um, we're also recording for the main issue is the trajectory by the phenotyping um, um, analyzed by the, the core impact um, studies. And together with the 75 sample patients, we also have their transcriptome profiled. So let's go into um, how the results is telling us. So the uh, first step we've tried to do is to do a general profiling to see if there's any correlations by DNA methylation and any of the traits. So this 
demographic trait like Asians, sex are um, showing up here. So as most of the methylone studies, this um, the samples is basically dichotomized by sex. Okay, like showing up here. And there's different tra clinical traits showing up here. So you can see there's also pretty good separations based on their respiratory status and days post admission and hospitalization. But it's pretty much uh, imaginable because um, these three um, traits is sort of um, associated or correlated. Like you stay in the hospital longer, your conditions might go better as well. But our main um, target is the trajectory group by immunophenotyping categorized. It's hard to tell from the general profiling. Okay. So for this one, we can only uh, very sh uh, for sure, like methylations is correlated with those time or severities. And we can even predict their prognosis by this uh, logistic regression models. So we dichotomize the samples based on their before D28 or after D28. And we can see pretty good uh, prediction rate uh, with AUC uh, as 0.8 for these models by just considering their methylations. And those top uh, CPGs to be correlated with these models are those virus duplications um, things coming up. So for this general profiling, so we know methylations is associated with the severity of COVID or in other terms is um, the days post hospitalization. And we can even predict for um, their hospitalization, their days of hospitalizations when we dichotomize them around day 28. Okay, so next we wanna ask, can we um, use uh, from the uh, precautious view, can we do any predictions for this trajectory that proposed by the impact studies? In other words, when the patients enter the hospital, can we know more whether this case will go bad or whether they will go fine uh, after the hospitalization? So that is the main question we wanna know with this cohort. Okay, so here is, we just um, take those baseline samples out. So baseline means the day, the first two to three days um, things then enter the hospital. And then when we profile their PCAs, you can see on the axis of PC1s, the main um, principal components is pretty much dichotomized by their low TG or high TG group. So it's uh, telling us there's association between uh, trajectory and also the methylation um, by just profiling the baseline samples. Okay, so we also uh, construct a uh, analyzed logistic regression models with this by training with the baseline samples. So it's the um, training model and testing for the rest. So here we exclude those the same individuals in a training set and predict for the, the follow-up time point, okay? So you can see the prediction power, I mean, the AUC is around 0.7. So it's rather moderate, but it's still saying that their methylations has those predictive powers to predict the TGs or how these patients will go in after the hospitalization state. Okay, so we also do the um, differentially methylated size ACEs, and we identify those 50 um, CPGs, they are hypermethylated in those ITG patients. Okay, so they are related to those several genes showing up here, and they are all uh, confirmed by so, um, other COVID studies with uh, transcriptome data. And um, you can see there's olivary nucleus maturations or uh, cycloindependent stuff showing up here. And we also identify those 86 hypomethylated CPGs, and they are uh, related to those macrophage differentiation or granulocyte differentiation pop out. So which means like this um, white blood cells, they are under, they are defensing those um, pathogens by inflammations. That's why they need this um, immunocell type to be hyperactive and they could be regulated by methylation. Okay, so from this analysis, we know the baseline DNA methylone, which means the first two days um, 
when they enter the hospital. We can know um, this patient's COVID-19 clinical trajectory after hospitalization. And we also identified differentially methylated CPGs. And those hypomethylations, they are related to the active state of macrophage and granulocyte differentiation. Hypermethylations are more related to T cell receptors and those specific stat proteins phosphorylation. Okay. So, so like I said in the beginning, um, we are analyzing the methylation from a liquid biopsy called PBMC, peripheral blood mononucleosides. So it is actually a composite cell types inside this um, biopsies. So which means the methylations we're um, analyzing is a mixture uh, from different cells, okay? So basically you might know uh, PPMC is isolated from the blood and then from those gradient um, um, centrifugations, the, this thin layer showing up will be um, the PPMCs we're analyzing. So they are composed by majority of the lymphocytes, T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes. They will be nature killer cells as well, will be monocyte as well. But usually you won't see those um, granulocyte or those cells coming from this myeloid progenitor lineage. Okay. But it is interesting for COVID. Okay. So like in the past few years, there will be two to three studies proposing this phenomenon called stress-induced um, myelopoiesis or granulopoiesis um, in COVID, severe COVID cases only. So for example, like this one, so these studies, they also analyze PBMC with the Infinium technologies, which means the array technologies. So they were analyzing those control and those from influenza, HIV, and severe COVID, uh, mild COVID cases. You can see their um, cell type compositions, uh, specifically the blue part, which will be the severe COVID cases. One showing up is like they will be really low in T cell, CD8 T or CD4 T. The, they will show in dominantly in neutrophil, which should not be seen in PBMC biopsy most of the time. Um, and this is not just the, only the studies, it's saying that it's multiple studies um, sort of identify this syndromes in specifically in co severe COVID. And their neutral fill to lymphocyte ratios is also really high um, showing up here. And it is not seen in this mild COVID, HIV, or other uh, virus infection, just specific for severe COVID, okay? So which uh, sort of fits those hypotheses proposed by immunologist, they were saying um, those mild cases, they will mainly defense the uh, SARS-CoV virus by their um, uh, immune systems. And they, if the immune system is really um, fine tuning, so their infection inflammations will keep low and their uh, cellular uh, immunity will come up really quick, the blue line showing up here, and then defense for the, and clear this mass for the individual, for the host. And for those hospitalized cases, or you can say severe COVID, severe cases like the impact we're studying, the inflammations keep going on across a long time and their cellular defense coming right, uh, way later than they should be, which means they increase those inflammation and let the innate immunities to fight for the virus, but their in, um, cellular immunities is not coming at the right time, okay? So that is how um, they cause or be a result for the severe um, COVID cases, okay? So we wanna see in the impact cohort, do we um, also see this myelopoiesis or granulopoiesis in um, specific uh, granulocytes aspect? So we propose, uh, we use a cell type deconvolution method, which is based on a non-negative least square um, set, um, equations. So imagine the PBMC is composed by these seven types of um, cells. We are trying to figure out which, um, what is the percentage or what is the ratio for each cell types 
to fit into this non-negative Wilson score models. Okay, so we ident first identify several uh, unique differentially methylated regions across in specific for each type of the cells and use this as the signatures to fit these models. And we finally um, can estimate it, for example, how much of the uh, PBMC are composed by neutrophil, how much of this um, uh, methylome is composed by the monocyte. So this is how we do the synthetic convolution. And so we can uh, profile the composition for these six cell types across the one year follow-up times. So you can see several trains from this um, time corpse data. And first of all, we uh, stratify the uh, patients into low TG or high TG based on their trajectory group by immunophenotyping. So you can imagine those high TG patients, they are um, like, um, they might stay in hospital long and they might be fatal, okay? So you can see there's way less naive T cells in this low TG group across all time, okay? And and also um, there's um, neutral field band and the very beginning, you can see there's really high uh, granulocytes or neutral, neutral fields showing up in this high TG group, okay? So nature, killer cells and monocyte, they also have this distinct phenomenon. Like at the beginning, the high TG group, they will be rather low in the proportions, but they will reconstitute it after hospitalization for um, probably um, one month, and then they will surpass this high low TG group. So this is would be the uh, leukocyte dynamics across this one year of follow-up. And we also look into cycle into the uh, baseline samples to ignore, to dis disregard those time or medical treatment phenomenon just by looking at their baseline um, profiles. So here you can see this um, clustering is based on the methylome themselves. And then we put up with their clinical traits, for example, their sex or their trajectory group and their cell type compositions. And we also profile their lymphoid tissues or myelo tissues um, showing up um, as a composite variable showing up here. So you can see just by clustering the methylations, this basically follow their lymphoid or the myeloid ratio showing up here. And this happened to be um, also related to their trajectory. So which is interesting because this might be the first time we know uh, the methylations, they could be classified just by their um, uh, myeloid ratio. And also this happened to be in line with those phenotyping um, categories um, from TG1 to TG5. And if you look into those hospitalization in the day 28 follow-up, you can see at the first two weeks, the high TG uh, patients, they will bear really low lymphoid to myeloid ratios. So that might be the reason why they have those se severe symptoms. And also we see those female cases, they also bear lower uh, lymphoid to myeloid ratios, which happen to be in line with the original impact study saying the female is always getting the worst cases from severe COVID. So. This tells us like within these severe cases in impact studies, we can even stratify severities among them by their trajectory and also methylation. Okay. So for those high TG patients, we found they are low in lymphoid to myeloid ratios, which will be called uh, lymphopenia or stress-induced um, myelopoiesis or granulopoiesis specifically for those high TG patients. And this phenomenon probably will, re, uh, from our time-lapse data, they might reconstitute around day 14 after hospitalization. And we know like previous studies, they always dichotomize the cases into healthy, um, mild or asymptomatic and severe. But from this impact studies, we even stratify all severe COVID cases by trajectory. And among these severe COVID, the leukocyte composition still varies very much, okay? So finally, we wanna 
So for now, we are say, seeing those descriptive phenomenons from methylations. We want to know more mechanistically, um, is their trajectory specific impact on DNA methylation? Okay, so previously we show uh, a univariate model by just predicting trajectory with the methylations. But, but as you can see, these biopsies are very dynamic. They are composed by several cell types. The patient themselves are various. They are different in sex, different in age, different in several aspects. So we incorporate this into a multivariate model. So the formulations are shown on top. We put the methylation matrix um, in y-axis would be the patients, um, the, each sample. And then the x-axis here would be per site CG methylations. And trait, the x matrix here would be like um, age, sex, and several demographics or clinical traits showing up here per patients. Okay. And we want to know the coefficient for every trace uh, compositions to contribute to this methylation matrix on the in uh, left hand side of these equations. Okay. So we can know this by the methylation matrix by multiplication for trade and coefficient. So, and then we do pseudo inverse to get the uh, coefficient matrix um, here, and then do another round of the pseudo inverse. You can get the trade matrix by multiplication of the methylation matrix with the coefficients on um, pseudo inverse, okay? So this is the predicted values we got to comprise these models. So here, the coefficient, uh, the correlation matrix shown up here will be the actual values correlated with the predicted values. And here will be the Spearman correlation value shown up and whether they are significant in these models. So you can see the trajectory group that like we are looking into is showing uh, significance and we can even um, see when they dichotomized by if there's low TG or high TG, there are a statistical differences from this uh, epigenetic predicted values. And with these values, we can do build up this um, ROC curve with um, area on the curve to 3.7 is a rather good uh, prediction model. And we even do with different training as testing data set, for example, we train with the baseline samples only and predict for the rest. And we train with the inpatient, pa inpatient samples and test with the outpatient samples and vice versa. And they are all showing uh, close to 0.7 AUC. So this all together telling us um, we can predict from baseline or from the earliest time point whether these patients to church or the development of COVID would go. Okay. And then when we um, uh, test for significance, for test for associations in these models, uh, is there any specific size um, specific to the determine the low or high TG? We found several sites located with these gray areas. I didn't show the coordinated here, but you can see there's um, listed from the ENCO studies there's different histone modifications and also um, DNA ACE um, to look for open chromatin regions from the three cell lines. So the first is the GM and the second is the embryonic stem cells. And we're looking at this one is the K562, which is a myelogenous leukemia cell lines. So what I try to say is we found those regions to be differentially methylated are also located on these regions, which is also the specific distal enhancers that happen to be in this uh, myelogenous uh, leukemia cell lines. And you can see there are methylations. Um, basically, there will be the demethylations in this high TG group. So the hypothesis here is we found these regions to be DNA demethyl to be demethylated in those high TG. Uh, patients, and that's why they they got those stress-induced granular poises that bad and caused those um, prolonged um, immune response or inflammation. Okay, so to summarize for the study for now, um, at the beginning, we know uh, DNA methylation is associated with severe COVID progression. 
and we know we can use DNA methylation only to predict whether they are early stage or the later stage for their development. And we can also predict for with just the baseline samples when they enter the hospital, whether this patient's case will go worse or go fine, okay? This is not only tested in the um, univariate model, but also with uh, those multivariate models after considering cell type compositions, age, and sex, et cetera, okay? So, and also we um, found that in high TG patients, their cell type compositions is really high with myelocyte. So, which is in line with those uh, previous studies uh, to find those stress-induced myelopoiesis. And important thing here is we even stratify these severe cases, um, not only um, with just saying these are hospitalized, but there are differences among these severe cases. Okay, and this trajectory could be determined by the DNA methylations on specific distal enhancers. Their methylations might determine whether this patients um they will go worst case or go to the good um they will recover well after hospitalization. Okay, so this will be the resource and to specific thanks to my advisor. Dr. Pellegrini and our collaborators in Read Lab, and also the impact communities, and also thanks to Idri for the computing resources. And let me present here. And thank you all for here to listen. And I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Simon. Uh, any questions? Uh... Just come online because we are very few people. So come online and you can. Oh, there is a question. Can you explain mm -hmm. slide 29? Okay. okay. So I might. So, so um, we try to identify specific genomic regions or their different, uh, their methylations. They are specific to determine uh, the low or high TG, right? So by testing this, we identified um, one regions, or you can see the composed by 10 to 12 CPG sites that are located in this gray highlighted areas. So they are not related to genes, okay? But they are related to those distal enhancers identified by ENCO project. And what makes this important is this is the enhancer regions only show up in this K562 cell lines, which is the myelopoies, um, myelogenous leukemia cell lines, which is saying they are, have, um, they are generating those myelo cells um, dramatically, okay? So what we found is like within these regions, their methyl CG methylations are differential between the low risk group, low TG or high TG group. So from this histogram, this is the, their CG methylation levels and their frequency. So the pink group is always left tilted compared to the gray part, which is the low TG, which means in those high TG patients, these regions are always hypomethylated, okay? So which means this specific regions is important for determining the patient's trajectory because they are showing differences in methylation. Okay. Uh, and by any uh, question on that, uh, just uh, come online and uh, there is anything. Any other question? But I have a, a basic question. Um, does these races and the gender play a role in any kind of uh, uh, correlation between these results? 
Um, what I can say is the the sex is different. Okay. So uh, they are basically, tr uh, you can see from this one is we found the female patients, they always have lower, um, they were at the beginning, they will have lower lymphoid ratios. And this is also like described by another studies, the impact study before, uh, mm -hmm. by phenotypically, they found that the female sex is the only reason they got the prolonged uh, inflammations or the severe post-COVID sequela. Um, here is they're trying to go to profile this with methylation wave, but basically it's correlated with the cell type composition. For our ethnicity, uh, we do include um, by um, genotype, um, how do you say, like this name called from this methylation data. So we put those uh, ancestry uh, coordinate into the models. And uh, so far, we don't see uh, much with the severity or the trajectory, um, but it's, um, it's still a good um, way to investigate. Christian, I ask this because of the cultural background, mm -hmm. people might be having different intake and they might have certain... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. If there is uh, no further questions, uh, let's uh, uh, let's thank Dr. Feynman and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, weekend. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Feynman. Thank you.